Okay. Week six. Uh, today, I want to talk about three things. Uh, first, ethics. Then, I'll talk about your storytelling speeches in general. And finally, I'll spend some time dedicated specifically to style. So, ethics. Now, I don't love the book's language about a code of ethics because there's a lot of different codes of ethics out there and these tend to clash with each other. Now, Emma asked, uh, do I follow the communications code of ethics or the journalism code of ethic ethics if I happen to be talking in an event that's about both? And the truth is, I don't really have an answer for that. Now, as a speaker, the most you can do is try and be transparent. You know, tell your audience what you know and tell them what you don't know, tell them who you are, and do your best to avoid misunderstandings, even when those benefit you. Public speaking is an act of service. It's a responsibility to your public. And that's the line I'm willing to draw in ethics here. To speak about a larger, a more general code of ethics would not in fact be a transparent of you because I'm coming from a very particular perspective, a very particular set of values. Uh, this one uh, is up to you, up to decide in any particular uh, situation what the code of ethics you ought to follow is. Um, but you should be thinking about it and at least in that point I agree with the book. So what do we learn about ethics now? Well, because storytelling is a powerful tool. We're using emotional appeals to convey a point, oftentimes without addressing our intention directly, what our real purpose of the story is. And that can be used for selfish purposes very effectively. So this is a reminder, well, not to do that. To always think of storytelling, of public speaking, as a service to a community, to others out there. Now, there's one specific question I wanted to answer about citing your sources. And it seems like a lot of you are still not quite comfortable with how to do it. Um, so here's an example. I'm, I'll perform one. Um, according to the textbook, Speechcraft by Thomas Dunn, uh, all you have to do is tell us the name of the sources and the author's name as well. Um, that's it. Now, many of you have pointed out that this doesn't necessarily sound natural. And I would agree with that, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's not meant to sound natural, it's meant to sound extemporaneous. Uh, the best thing you can do, I think, is to go ahead and make sure your sources are written down. Um, and so you can actually just read that citation every time you have to do it. Um, in fact, having your sources feel scripted is better than having them feel like you just pulled them out of your ass. Um, you know, the speech is a scripted performance. We're trying to make it appear more natural more conversational, but what people expect is a performance. Um, and so to rely on the performative part of speech making to give out your sources is the correct thing to do. And then to rely on the more conversational side of speech making to give out your opinions uh, feels more natural. Um, don't be afraid of citing your sources in this way. Don't be afraid to read those citations. Um, okay, for your storytelling speech, uh, you don't actually have to cite sources. There's no need to cite your sources because that would break the storytelling spell. Um, they still have to be in your bibliography, especially if you're taking your story from specific sources. You know, if you're not making it up, uh, if you're compiling your story out of different stories, make sure you cite those in your bibliography. If you're taking your story directly from somewhere else, make sure you're citing it in your bibliography. Um, you are still turning in an outline, which is where your bibliography is. But this time, however, it's not the preparation outline, so not the entire story written down. Instead, um, it's just the bullet point outline, the speaking outline. Um, if you have any questions, you know where to reach me. Now, let's talk about storytelling. As a genre, stories are incredibly varied, right? I hope you have started thinking about what your story is going to be and how it's going to be shaped. Uh, but I imagine it's not yet clear what my expectations are or what your expectations for yourself should be. Um, for that reason, I want to talk about the rubric today. Um, I'm going to send it to you over email just about the same time I uh, upload this video. 
Um, so if you want to give it a look before you continue, go ahead and do that. If not, you can do so after my lecture. Now the rubric looks very different than the formative speech rubric. This one has six overall categories. Narrative, logic and structure, audience and topics, ethos and pathos, language and style, delivery, and exploration and effect. Um, each category has a series of questions below it in the rubric. Um, you don't have to answer all those questions. They're meant to be guides as to what it uh, means to be aware of your narrative, logic, and structure, or your audience and topic, for example. Um, but they are the kind of things I'm looking for, so make sure that your stories do answer some of those, or at least are aware of those questions. Uh, let's go through them. First is narrative logic. Now, have you given thought to the structure of your story? Is there a reason your story is constructed in the way that it is? You know, does it adapt the basic hero's journey um, to your material? Um, you know, giving a still, an introductory setup, uh, a climax that it's building towards, and a moment of reflection at the end to think about what the story has taught us. Now, a climax is often a point of contention because people think it has to be a kind of, you know, climactic battle. Uh, specifically because we use the hero's journey, which is like an adventurous model for story structure as a base. Uh, and the truth is it doesn't have to be. The climax simply has to be uh, the, a moment of reckoning with the story's real theme. It can be a heartbreak, it can be a silent, it doesn't have to be a battle, but it does have to be something that we're building towards, something that challenges the characters in the story. Um, I think the best thing to do here is uh, think about what kind of um, other stories your story looks like. Right? If you're able to categorize your story in a genre, it becomes a lot easier to think about what the climax in those other similar stories are. And this is something I'm going to be returning over and over again throughout this lecture. What is your story's genre? And how are you going to use that genre to guide how you construct that story. Let's talk about the audience and the topic. Was your story made with the audience in mind? This is the overarching question here. It's important not just to think about your topic and the plot, but about the characters in your, in your setting. Would your audience be familiar with those characters in, in the story? How about the places? It's okay if they're not, but it does mean that you have to spend the extra time describing them and giving them shape and the place. Um, if, however, your audience is very aware of the characters and the setting of your story, then it would be bad to spend so much time returning to those characters, describing them. Instead, you can take those things for granted. Again, think about the genre in which your story is set. You know, is it a high school drama? Is it a coming of age story? Is it American? Or is it foreign, perhaps? And does your audience know about that genre? Um, thinking about the genre is oftentimes the way in which you can resolve uh, creative conflicts during your invention process. Um, now let's talk about a, one that's a little more complicated, ethos and pathos. This one is about intention and demonstrating that intention. Does this story make you sound like an asshole is a good starting point. You know, are you making fun of your characters or are you using their suffering for a reason? Um, are you using emotional appeals cheaply or do they come out of our care for the characters you have described? Um, for example, if people are suffering in your story but it doesn't help your thesis, then that's just gratuitous uh, violence. Right? Instead, you ought to demonstrate goodwill towards your story and towards your audience. Again, does this story make you sound like an asshole? If the answer is yes, then you might be doing something wrong. Let's talk about that. The next category is language and style. And I want to skip that one because I'm going to take a little bit extra time to talk about style in its own section. So we're going to move on to delivery. Now, part of your delivery obviously depends on your style. Your hand gestures, your tone of voice, your pace, they all weight on your delivery, but they are derived from style. What is purely delivery, however, is how confident in your storytelling you are. Practice, practice, practice. It's okay to read from your notes, but only sparsely and never during important moments. 
Now, unlike in your informative speeches, where reading a thesis statement or reading your sources and your facts is good practice, um, in the story, you don't want to take away from your delivery when you reach a climactic moment. Right? Think about um, Anthony Griffith's story last week. It was a very sad story. And as we're getting close to his daughter's death, um, he tells us that the doctor told him that she only has six weeks to live. However, he makes a mistake and says six uh, days to live. Um, he quickly gets over the mistake, but after hearing that someone has six days to live and then being corrected to six weeks to live, the audience feels relief at a moment when they should be feeling tragedy. Um, you need to make sure that those particular lines, the narrative beats of your story are well-practiced and don't get in the way. Uh, your mistakes don't get in the way of your audiences feeling the feelings you intend them to. Um, Also, now while I understand it's a bit uncomfortable to talk to a camera in your house or in your dorm, um, I'm gonna need you to get a little bit out of your comfort zone and be loud. Um, this isn't necessarily about volume, but I've noticed that a lot of you are getting really close to the camera and whispering all of your lines like you're disturbing someone in the other room. Now, it's okay if there's literally someone in the other room that you can't disturb. Now make sure you send me an email and that way I'm aware of it and won't grade you down for it. But I do want you to take a step back and be more dynamic towards the camera. Um, perform, deliver in a way that feels like you're really putting your whole self into it um, instead of just trying to get away with it by whispering. Um, if you whisper, you really don't have a lot of places to go with your dynamic range. However, if you start at this uh, a more natural speaking style, you can go down and whisper when necessary or be louder if you have to. Um, again, do what the story calls for. Don't hold yourself back because of the medium you think you're in. Um, I also want to remind you about the lesson I gave last week about the framing of the camera. Uh, what are you showing of us and why? Uh, give us an angle that we can see you so you can more freely perform your delivery. Okay. Uh, now lastly, exploration and effect, by which I mean, um, were you successful in doing what you set out to do? A little confusing. There's so many things you can do with your story. It's hard to decide or to tell you that there's one particular thing that is right. Instead, what I'm interested in is whether you are really indulging, really trying to do what you're doing well. Um, that is, if you chose a genre, are you really uh, using all of the elements that can make a speech better for it? Um, you know, are you delivering? Are you performing in the way you want to perform? Is your narrative structure helping you in that same theme? Kind of like the rhetorical effectiveness category in your last rubric, this one is about doing the things you set out to do well. Are you exploring the themes that you decided to put in your story well? Are you effective in the way you're conveying the message you want to convey? Not about right or wrong, but about doing the things, fulfilling your own thematic goals. Okay, that's the basic rubric for your story. Uh, make sure to give the document a read and go over the questions. If there's anything that you don't quite understand, um, post it on the discussion section of this week. That way I can publicly answer those questions. And if you'd rather have a uh, more personal conversation about your story uh, because it's a sensitive topic or because you don't want to give away any spoilers, um, then send me an email. I would be very, very happy to workshop your stories personally in an office hour. Um, next week, there will be no assignments. Just like during your informative speech delivery week, this week there's nothing else for you to worry about other than your storytelling speech. They have to be turned in by Thursday night, and you have to turn in your outline with them. Uh, take your time, write a good story. Practice, practice, practice. Now, uh, I wanna talk about style. Style is arguably one of the most important parts of your storytelling speech, because it's what really unifies the themes, plot, and structure of your story. Um, 
in a story particularly, you want to be uh, taken over by the narrative. You want to kind of forget that you're listening to a story and instead focus completely on the content. And the best way to do that is to have a unified delivery with the other parts of the story. So the best thing you can do, once again, is think about what genre your story falls under and copy that same style from other media that fits the same genre. Think about Erin Baker's speech uh, this week. Um, she does a childhood story, not exactly a coming of age uh, genre, but definitely about the balance between childhood and adulthood. Um, for that reason, Erin chooses to act like a child herself in the story. Now she isn't throwing a tantrum or anything, uh, but her demeanor is shy. She's hiding behind the microphone and talking in a sort of monotone voice that reminds me of a kid that's being forced to tell a story to a bunch of adults. The way she delivers her jokes is kind of self-indulgent, not in that she thinks she's funny, but she, like, she thinks everything she's telling you is kind of lame. This like child teenager vibe really conveys the theme of her story and they're done very subtly, really well. She's sort of acting, not exactly a character, but a feeling, a childlike awkwardness and earnestness that really helps to communicate her story. I want you to do the same thing. Don't think of the particular hand gestures that you have to do or the particular tones or paces. Uh, instead, think of the feeling that you're trying to convey and act like it, perform. Give yourself the space and the, uh, the creativity to do something out of what you would normally do yourself. If your story is a mystery, for example, act like a noir detective. Or if it's a spookier mystery, then pretend you're a crypt keeper or you're telling a campfire story. If it's about high school, then act like a high schooler. Instead of trying to figure out what specific things to do, Think about what feelings your story is relying on. That's it for today. If you have any questions, reach me through the discussion post or through email. And I want to send another reminder uh, to please follow the deadlines. If you're having trouble meeting the deadlines, send me an email. If you're just not submitting things and not telling me about it, then you're losing points. Um, speeches only get harder and they only hold more of your weight. If at the end of the quarter, you're gonna need an extra five points to like make sure you pass the class, um, you're not gonna want to have lost them by not turning in uh, weekly comments. Uh, so if you're having trouble meeting the deadlines, email me and let's figure something out. Have a good one. Can't wait for the speeches.